Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll get started then. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, and thank you uh, for joining us again, uh, the HGN, uh, for another one of our quarterly uh, discussion panels, uh, the final one of this year. Uh, in the new year, uh, we will be moving on to our next theme, uh, which will be education. And you can find the uh, corporate papers um, uh, on the website uh, at the moment. So uh, if you're interested in that, please do check it out. But uh, without further ado, let's uh, deal with today's theme, which is, of course, post-colonialism. And I'm very happy to have with us a great uh, panel of guests. Um, we did have to have a cancellation from Meghna uh, because she was ill. So uh, thankfully we have uh, Nick Hill who has agreed to stand in at very short notice. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, so I'll just give a little bit of background on uh, all of our uh, speakers today. So we have uh, Ashley Bird, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of American Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, Ashley is a Native American games designer and holds a PhD in Native American Studies. Her 2021 dissertation, Representation and Reclamation, the History and Future of Natives in Gaming, addresses representations of Native American characters in video games and seeks to reorient game design towards decolonial methods which can promote Indigenous futures. Um, we also have uh, Stella Wisdom with us who is a digital curator for contemporary British collections at the British Library, with professional interests in digital publishing and emerging formats, including the collection and preservation of narrative apps and inter interactive fiction. Stella has collaborated widely on game-related projects and events, notably Off the Map with Game City and the National Video Games Museum, LitCraft, a Lancaster University-led initiative which builds literary worlds in Minecraft, and with AdventureX to host narrative games conventions at the library. We also have Nikhil Murthy, uh, who is an uh, experimental video game developer currently working on the post-colonial 4X game Nikhil Murthy Civilization, um, which uh, looks absolutely fantastic and answers actually a lot of the uh, stuff that I talked about in my blog, blog post, a lot of concerns I have about colonialism in games. Uh, so looking forward to hearing more about that. Um, before we go on, uh, we just have to say uh, a big thank you to InGame, which is the project that uh, funds the HGN and allows us to do this work. Uh, InGame, uh, which stands for Innovation for Games and Media Enterprise, is uh, a research and development centre based in the heart of the Dundee Video Games Cluster. It's led by Abate University in partnership with the University of Dundee and the University of St Andrews and local and international industry partners. InGame delivers innovative research and offers research and development support and services to games companies in the city and beyond, and is part of the Creative Industries Cluster Program, funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and part of the uh, Industrial Strategy. Um, we should also mention uh, the we get funding from the Scottish Funding Council as well. Uh, so thank you to everybody there that allows us to uh, do the work we do at the HGM. So, without further ado, uh, I think we'll move towards uh, our questions. Um, so, hopefully, uh, people in the audience have read uh, the blog posts that we have had, um, quite a lot of blog posts for this theme, lots of people had things to say, uh, that have discussed these kind of issues in lots of different ways, but I think we'll start with a sort of basic question of how have uh, games produced and continue to produce or reproduce colonialist assumptions you know what kind of uh, sort of colonial rhetoric is embedded uh, in games uh, and sort of how does it manifest um so maybe we could start with uh ashley um first for this question sure yeah i mean a lot of the work that i uh, do specifically looks at kind of, you know, Native American representation in games. And this is a big way in which we see um, colonial narratives replicated in digital spaces. And a lot of that comes through things like uh, removing Indigenous peoples from their traditional territories in gamic spaces, even games that are supposed to be um, historically accurate in some way. Um, you know, games that are set in the West tend to completely remove Indigenous peoples or part of the game itself is removing Indigenous peoples um, in order to make the land consumable. And this kind of is relates to like a broader narrative that you see in games that, you know, um, land is a consumable object. It's, it's part of, um, that's part of the 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 space of 
the play is 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 conquering, taking over, utilizing land and its resources um, in kind of this extreme way that has little to no negative side effects. Um, and and so so this um, very problematic relationship with space is a big way in which I see uh, colonialism replicated in digital spaces. Yeah, absolutely. I, and that's sort of been a reoccurring theme in, in, in a lot of the blog posts, this, this relationship between space and power. Um, and I think it's interesting the way you talk about the sort of representations of indigenous communities in, in games and that sort of lack of nuance or even worse, perhaps, you know, the sort of reenactment of sort of crimes of colonialism, basically. Um, maybe we could turn to uh, Nicole to add uh, something to this uh, question. Uh, how, is it, how is it that games generally reproduce colonialism and colonialist assumption? So I'm of course specialized in uh, forex games and civilization, given my game Civilization. And the colonialism of civilization is basically a solved problem at this point. We, we all know what it is. Put very succinctly, it's that civilization lets you play any country as long as it's present day United States of America. Right. And what's, what I aim to do with civilization is to try to highlight the things that the current crop of Forex games sort of glide over. So most fundamentally, that is, uh, that is by having civilization be a cooperative game rather than framing, con framing history as the conflict between nations. And then in addition to that, there's things just like history from below, tech skepticism and pollution, right? Because civilization is a game that loves seeing numbers go up with absolutely no cost associated, to, associated with that. And my goal is really to have uh, this game be in conversation with civilization. So you see one set of systems that are you that are used to represent uh, basically everything, right? History, the present day, economies, everything. And you see my game present a different set of uh, systems. And so hopefully that will lead players to ask what are, what are even further systems that we could use to represent the space? What are other things that games have yet to put down? Yeah, it, re it really does look like a fantastic game. You know, as you said, uh, the, the notion of cooperation rather than necessarily competing, which I think is very nice because uh, it sort of broadens that, you know, cultural perspective, that, that view on, you know, history only being able to unfold in one way. And as you say, that way is, you know, the history of the United States, uh, Europe, you know, and that, that colonial sort of history. Um, I, I wish I'd come across your uh, game before I wrote my blog, to be honest, because <laughs> it answered so much of, uh, of the critique I offered there. Um, yeah, so uh, the same question then for uh, Stella, you know, how are these games um, and, and more broadly uh, sort of interactive media uh, reproducing these kind of colonial assumptions from your point of view? I've got a bit of a confession. I've not played games like Civilization and I must admit, um, I suppose before I got involved in games collaborations using cultural heritage material, I'd probably got a bit of a negative personal impression of games because um, I did kind of think, oh gosh, an awful lot of them are about battles and war and empire and things that, that, that I felt quite uncomfortable about. And it's only really, um, I suppose, as, as I, as so I must admit, even when I started the off the map games competition using British Library um, collections to make games, I was a bit worried about what what kind of games would be produced um, with, with with materials, and I, I suppose. I'm possibly more interested in kind of empathy narrative games um, and it, it's it's. I must admit, a lot of this, a lot of my personal opinions were probably quite naive because I wasn't immersed in the world of games. So I don't work in the games industry and I'm not a historian, I'm a librarian. Um, and it's it's really been kind of seeing, I'm really interested in kind of cooperative games or games that will imagine um, new worlds or games that reimagine the past in, in different ways. Um, but what, what I was going to say is, is probably why you have got um, games that keep replaying um stereotypes and 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 kind of like you say quite traumatic things is even if you look at 
if you look at the kind of history of cartography and kind of why the world was mapped, it, it's it's to do with do domination and 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 exploration. Um, so it's, I suppose, I suppose what's quite difficult is, is the kind of especially the histories that are recorded in archives and libraries and institutions. Um, it, it's it's kind of it's what was it what it's what was printed. It's what has been preserved and that's what is obviously has been retained from the past by the colonizers and, and by the kind of the people who've dominated the world um, and it, it's only been in more recent years that there's been a lot of efforts especially with kind of oral history programs um, and a lot of kind of community archiving programs trying to get different kind of histories recorded and into the into the collection so I've got a bit off topic here um, but 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 like I say I was kind of quite off put off um, the kind of nature of lots of lots of games just because of, of, of kind of um, I suppose subject matter um, yeah I, I mean I, I don't think it is uh, off topic so much actually because I think um, you know when we talk about the way these things have been constructed in heritage and, and history um, you know, of course, this is the sort of collective resource that games developers have drawn from anyway. So, I mean, it, it, it totally makes sense to me to, to think about those things in regard to that. Um, yeah, and very much, you know, like the stuff you said about map there, you know, you look at strategy games and the first thing you start with is a map, you know, that's that's the, the use of space. And so that history, of course, that plays into it. I think that's you know, very relevant, as is the the games industry's fascination with war of course which you know then leads to sort of conflict as a as a central theme and, and then sort of as soon as you move history into that inevitably you get these kind of colonial themes so i think that's i think it's very relevant um and also i think uh thinking about sort of alternative game structures like sort of so-called empathy games or you know these sort of more experimental games where they can leave behind a lot of this baggage if you like that you know the history of of the games industry or of, of forms of play has, has sort of left so i think that it's, it's very useful sort of reflections um okay um so i wanted to ask a question about uh what we think you know often the problem the colonial sort of rhetoric embedded in games is because of the things they contain um but as ashley sort of uh, hinted at uh, in her answer to the first question, it's also often about what they, you know, uh, leave out, basically, what absences um, are left out. So um, I'd like to sort of ask a question about what do you think are the most significant absences from the historical discourse on colonialism that games present at the moment? What's missing from these games? What's missing more widely from popular media, essentially, you know, because there's always, of course, this overlap between film and, and games and, and historical novel and documentary and, and things like that. What are the things that are absent in the discourse about colonialism that need to be more present in, and uh, are sort of excluded that sort of add to these sort of problematic representations? Um, and maybe we could start with uh, Nikhil this time. So, um... Me, the biggest, the, the, I mean, the space is so large, there's so many issues. But one thing that I want to highlight is just that there's kind of been a flattening of post-colonialism. And this comes up a lot with my game. But uh, what, I, what I really want to highlight here is that post-colonialism means something in India, but it will mean something very different to someone in, let's say, Algeria or Haiti, because these are all very different anti-colonial struggles. And even within India, it's one thing to be, it's one thing to view the, the colonial struggle if you are a caste Hindu. It's another thing if you're Muslim, it's another thing if you're Dalit, it's another thing if you're Adivasi, it's another thing in places like Kashmir in the northeast of India, right? So yet despite all of these very different perspectives on post-colonialism, it's all kind of gotten flattened down into a single post-colonial narrative. And in doing so, we lose a lot of, of the space that these different, or these different angles would have in conversation with each other. And then the other thing here is, that, is, which is related to this, is that colonialism is still ongoing. It, it is a past event that casts shadows into the present, but the United States still has colonial, still has colonial uh, territory. The United Kingdom still has colonial territory. And India has colonial territory right now. 
right? This, this is all still colonialism. These are not dead issues that have been buried in the past. They are going on at this moment. So, I, and once again, I think that you can, it's, it's easy to overlook this if your post-colonial view has been restricted to what is very not to what is very naturally a few dominant viewpoints but it is important when you talk post-colonialism to bring in people from a much wider range of places than we we normally think of i've never seen an algerian person speak on post-colonialism in a post-colonial talk for instance i've just never seen that i don't know where to go for that right i've never seen a kashmiri person speak on post-colonialism right so I, I do think we need to really broaden what we think of when we think of post-colonialism to more than just the standard, the, the post-colonial things that, that automatically jump to the top of the mind. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really useful reflection, you know, that we do tend to group these things under, you know, one sort of uh, academic heading, if you like, yeah, whereas... Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's a really good reflection. And, and you know, maybe that reflects uh, on how we need to be thinking about games as well. You know, there might not be one fits all solution for how we sort of address the colonial rhetoric embedded in games, because it might be what post-colonial discourse are we using here and what colonialism we're responding to. And, and, you know, to lose the context in that would be, yeah, that makes a complete sense. That's a really good reflection. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Stella, uh, what's, what, in your opinion, is still missing from the sort of discourse on colonialism in popular media or in uh, heritage or uh, curatorship? Or... So I suppose it's, it's thinking of, 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 of different voices. And so in our historical collections, um, I'm thinking especially in, in terms of colonialism. So I'm, at the British Library, we've got the India Rothis papers in our, in our archives with lots and lots of lists of things it, it, it's, it's kind of so so these are archives that date kind of um pre-1947 um and, and go back and you kind of look at all the things that were kind of documented and, and listed but you're only getting one half one side of the story here um and so kind of um so certainly looking at this it's kind of what's the unspoken stories or what are you not getting from, from some of these kind of more formal inf information in the archives so we've got I was looking recently at lists of um post office staff and, and and mail staff and we've actually been creating entries in Wikidata for kind of um postal postal staff in India um with, with records from the from the India office but we're not actually having those people's stories so it's not like we've got their diaries or it's not like we've got their memories and 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 it it's 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 kind of obviously if you have got archives where you've got both of these things that's wonderful and then you can kind of really kind of make these things human and actually sometimes even from the kind of lists I'm just thinking there was an amazing project using weather data from ship's logs um, and at one point in the ship's log logs um, I think they'd lost all their chocolate rations but this was then mentioned in the logs and you could really empathize with this ship and they'd lost their lost their rations and, and there was a more human element to it um, but I really often it is these kind of human stories how are people affected how are people affected by famine how are people affected by um disasters um it, it is kind of and you really need kind of a kind of like diary entries or, or kind of oral histories where you can get them to kind of get these rich details of how kind of individuals I think I think it's when you it's like if you're looking at kind of big organizations and bureaucracy you're getting kind of how governments uh, or the army uh, or you're getting kind of how, um, that, that kind of picture but but really it's kind of looking at looking at the individuals and how they were affected by things and their dilemmas and their choices and their suffering and it, it's it's kind of those sorts of things thinking of the games being paid what I'm quite interested actually is quite is kind of hobbyist games or games that are made in game jams or kind of amateur games makers and and I think about this a lot because I think sometimes if people are not having to make games that are going to be commercially successful people can be freer um, to be a lot more experimental with the types of games that they're they're kind of creating so from a from a kind of wearing my hat trying to collect digital material now I'm very interested in in kind of what um 
say say individual like, like i say maybe people not charging for their games taking part in game jams what type of games are they are they making because i kind of feel that they'll be more ephemeral than than the games being produced by AAA studios where there's lots of copies and they'll probably be more formally recorded so so it really is kind of thinking thinking of the person yeah i think that's uh that's uh, again a really good reflection because it sort of reminds me of sort of one of the problems we talk about in strategy games a lot of the time where you have this sort of macro viewpoint of you know whatever historical events are taking place but the humanistic element is lost which of course is a real problem when you're talking about things such as colonialism and it sort of reminded me where you talk about the evidence there and you've got this organizational kind of uh, body of evidence if you like but the 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 everyday you know the the this sort of social history of colonialism is kind of harder to to grasp uh, so you can sort of see an echo in games of the sort of the problems of doing that kind of historical research in in you know uh, in archives as well yeah that's uh thank you um actually um the same question then what what's what's missing from the uh discourse of colonialism particularly in games yeah so i think for me it's it's some similar points to stella and nickel and to especially in representations of colonialism in the United States and when it comes down to indigenous people I mean if you'd ask I think myself and any other indigenous person the United States is still a colonial state it's still an occupied territory as far as we're concerned you know what I mean um so there and that being said like they're in games in particular and I think in you know social discourse and, and the way we teach colonialism there's this cognitive dissonance between the like historical colonization and the fact that like that is still something that affects the way that we live our lives today. Um, there's there's this gap between those those levels of understanding, um, and you see that in games as well. You know when I talk about like oh games that enact the removal of indigenous people, um, especially because indigenous people in the U.S. are still seen as like historical objects where the people trapped in time were almost always represented in you know the mid to late 1800s and that is it and not as as modern people who exist in the modern world um and that perpetuates um those types of games perpetuate this narrative and we don't talk about how those acts of colonization and dispossession and violence inherently affect the way our lives are being lived today and things like the reservation system and issues of sovereignty um, and there is, again, especially with, you know, indigenous folks and colonization, there's a flattening, like Nicole said, of colonialism and the experience of colonialism. Um, you have that game, This Land is My Land, which has the tagline of like, experience the frontier from the other side, as if there was one uniform experience of colonization for indigenous people, for l over 500 distinct groups of indigenous peoples in the United States. And that's just completely inaccurate. And again, it's also completely different um, how those groups are living their lives today. Like the experience they had determines their existence in the world today. Um, so I think, like I said, there's this, there's this lack of um, putting together kind of past and present and the relationship between those and, you know, colonization and what that looks like today. Like for indigenous peoples in the United States, post-colonialism really isn't a thing. It's still happening um, every single day. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, I can absolutely see that point. Yeah, very much. And it's sort of, yeah, post-colonialism sounds like the wrong term now, doesn't it? You know, it's it's almost like the sort of the post-race discourse, which is, you know, almost inevitably used by the, the right wing uh, to claim that, you know, structural racism doesn't exist. Uh, I can absolutely see the sort of similar uh, problem there. And then, you know, maybe maybe that's part of the issue as well, is that we stop we have to stop treating colonialism as something only in historical games you know uh that it's you know this is obviously a wider thing certainly in the games industry but also within the stories that are told within the games industry you know as, as you were talking then I, I sort of struggled to think of a single sort of indigenous american character in a contemporary setting game i think i think prey is the only game i can think of which is obviously a science fiction game um so yeah that that resonates very much so um Okay, I think that sort of takes us quite neatly onto uh, one of the other questions I wanted to talk about because I think we're sort of headed that way. Um, how do we uh, negotiate the inherent legacy of uh, 
colonial power structures and the political economy that surrounds the games industry beyond the stories that the games industry tells. Uh, and again, this applies, you know, beyond the games industry, really, this applies, you know, through, throughout sort of entertainment media as well. Um, so I'm thinking about the fact that, you know, even if the stories that these games told were, uh, you know, perfect and, and the kind of histories we would want to see uh, and address these topics sort of with sensitivity and nuance, they would still be played on hardware that is produced because of the legacy of colonialism from uh, exploitative lithium mining to exploitative sort of labor practices in the games industry you know where the the laborious work that no one wants to do is shipped off to uh, other economies where um, people are paid much much lower wages uh, for example um, so there's this kind of relationship between obviously capitalism and an economic imperialism that still goes on today there's a legacy of colonialism and of course the games industry is very heavily embedded in that is it possible to address these things from the point of view of games design or games research or from heritage these kind of embedded sort of uh, structures or is this something that's a much larger problem that we sort of can't do anything about um maybe we could start uh with uh Nikhil for this question um so i, I think i have um for me, honestly, I think the answer is just going the streets. You know, I think that we tend, we, I, I think that this happens. We start seeing ourselves as game designers or game academics first, when really we can just be people. You know, we can just do what everybody else does. We don't need to address it through video games, through video game structures. We don't, through academic papers. We can just do what everybody else does. We're all people, you know. I, I don't I don't even want the games industry to take the lead on solving the ecological issues and the colonial issues of video games because I don't think we can be trusted with it. I wouldn't trust the oil industry to do the same for oil. Why would I trust games to do it for games? You know? Just be people. People, people work against these struggles every day. We don't have to shackle ourselves to video games, you know. I personally am making Civilization because it's a very interesting game design space, you know? I'm not doing it to be Vakla Havel. I'm not doing it to make Guernica and be Picasso. I'm just doing it because it's interesting. When CAA happened, I went in the streets, you know? I, I just think, do what everybody else does, right? We don't, we, don't have to, we don't have to view everything through the lens of video games. Yeah, I think that I think that's a very fair response. Yeah, uh, Stella, do you think games do let us imagine other futures? So this might be a bad thing to say on on a historical games network event, but I do think obviously art and fiction and film and games let us imagine different futures. Um, so so. There is part of me thinking the games industry could help us imagine a better way forwards, especially in times, in, especially in difficult times. And sometimes even, I'm just, think, I'm just thinking, even changing the hardware, now some, some of this again might be experimental space rather than kind of big companies, but I've been thinking, having this conversation, I was thinking of a student games that I saw at a degree show at Goldsmiths University, where there was like a hand crank and you had to imagine that you were keeping a server farm running, but you'd got to feed yourself as well. And you had to, you had to keep winding this hand crank to keep the servers running and to store up enough energy to buy food for yourself to keep going. Now, basically, this was a game that everyone lost because no one could indefinitely keep turning this crank. But that's I, I probably saw this at a degree show maybe two, three years ago, and it stayed with me because there was no, you could not win. It was a game that you could not win, and it was a very physical game, um, and, and it just really got a message home about the kind of materiality of digital and how kind of servers and the cloud, and we all talk about these things in very ephemeral and ethereal ways, but they've all got like physical impacts. So... I'm, I'm kind of excited about experimental kind of things like that that students are doing, but I do think that the games industry and all of creative entertainment can help us imagine better futures for ourselves. It's a big responsibility. Yeah, yeah I think, yeah, I think that don't worry at all, you know, about 
talking about it uh, in a history game sort of context, because I, I think, you know, that's that's the purpose of history ultimately is, you know, we hope that we learn from the past to help us move into the future in better ways. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, but I, I like this idea as well. So maybe we can talk about the external problems of the games industry by using the internal capabilities of games as a mode of expression um, to sort of point out uh, those sort of those sort of elements. Um, Ashley? Yeah, I think um, I think some of the problem for me is, um, and I think this like a lot of the problems in games come from the like gap between game production, game scholars, and consumers. Like there's no chain of communication between all of those things. And as much as games consume, like game players like to think that they know what's going on in the industry and that they have a voice to the developers and things like that, and they do now more than ever there's still tons of gray areas that they just don't know about. And this is one of them of like where games come from and the material resources that go into de the development of video games and how that inherently affects um, actual people in the world, like coltan mining and things like that. And like, we do need to educate consumers so that they can be conscientious consumers. So. I think it was Nintendo has like published something about like they only source Coltan from um, like valid, you know, above board sources. And I don't know if we believe that or not, you know what I mean? But um, how are consumers going to know who to support with their money if they don't have that information? Um, and if they don't even realize that things like that are happening to go into their, to, into the production of, of, of their games, like the fact that, you know, Coltan, the cost of Coltan spiked disproportionately in 2001 and when the PlayStation 2 came out, um, that there was like a Coltan crisis. Um, and I think something like, and sometimes I think engaging with the platform to demonstrate that can be kind of helpful. If you look at Paolo Pettercini's iPhone game, which got banned from the App Store because of the fact that it discusses things like Coltan mining and mental health crises and the development of technology. and um, it's like a it's a very powerful um, piece of software when you play that game to be like oh wow like this is this is the route my phone goes through to come into my hand and like the thing that I'm holding right now did all of these things um, so I'm not saying we have to always make games about that kind of thing but I think they can be helpful and I just do think it's about getting the information out there to consumers of like this is what goes into this and so like you need to know that and you can just like everything else like Nicole said like you can protest you can vote with your dollar um, those those kinds of things yeah absolutely and, and I think uh you know, even beyond the hardware, the sort of political economy of the stories that are allowed into the mainstream games industry is obviously, you know, embedded with sort of uh, colonial legacies, basically, and, and the, the way collective memory has been formed by, by those legacies. Um, so it's, it is a very complicated thing because you have these sort of multi-level, the stories within games, the stories allowed to be made within games, then the hardware and labor and everything that goes into it. So it, I can see why it's a very difficult subject to convey to wider audiences because it's, you know, it's complicated. Um, but yeah, certainly, certainly one uh, worth pursuing. Um, okay. Um, okay, let's go with this question, I think. Uh, I think we sort of bumped up against this, though, the beginning to talk about this. Um, sort of uh, in some of the other questions we've talked about, but to what degree can we see these issues regarding uh, the sort of depiction of colonialism and the discourse surrounding it as a problem of our wider historical discourse or a problem specifically of the medium of games and their audiences and the sort of economic pressures that surround that? You know, how much of this is something that is specific and unique to games and how much of it is something that is just it's the same as everything else in popular media or, you know, the same as the problems we have in the way we uh, talk about colonialism in our collective memory. Uh, and maybe we could uh, talk to Stella first for that. I've been thinking about games that sometimes don't have a global release. So I went, I've, I've been to some quite interesting events organised by um, the Japan Institute in London a few times and games that kind of sometimes are just re really kind of region speci specific. So um, they were demoing a calligraphy game, a Japanese game about calligraphy, and it was not released in the West. We never saw this game. Um, so, so I do sometimes wonder about things that, that will have like, just like region specific releases and, and they might be amazing things, but if 
yeah, they're not translated or, or kind of available globally. It's um, don't quite know <laughs> what the answer is there, but I suppose, um, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe that's that's sort of part of the answer here is the sort of sharing, the, the actual sharing of sort of nuanced representations from sort of different regions that maybe don't make the, the, the translation kind of thing when, you know, it's only the big titles that, let's be honest, are the most culturally homogenous most of the time anyway, that, that actually make that kind of transition. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm, also, I'm also thinking language as yeah. as well as well. It, it, it's it's. I'm sure. I'm sure um, that the, there's games re released in other languages. But again, it, I've not played them. Um, I've often wondered about kind of kind of the games industry and games available in Spanish or other kind of like global languages. And it it's one of I know I keep talking about other events. I went to an event organised by European Studies Department about kind of interactive digital literature in other languages, and it blew my mind. There was lots of papers on on kind of um, works in other languages I've just not been aware of, and and so I do kind of think um, we probably globally the global releases are kind of works in English and and that's kind of limiting what I'm aware of or or what what I understand so I just I just kind of think yeah it's of a translation issue how many games are trans are widely translated yeah but I think that's a, a, a useful reflection to sort of think about um when we're trying to sort of build a um an international discourse, I suppose, but again, we have to be careful not to lose the sort of local nuance, as as Nikhil uh, said earlier. Um, so I think uh, it's uh, Nikhil next. Um, how much of this, what we're talking about, is a problem of games, and how much of it is a, a wider problem of of I don't know popular media or or generally, you know, the way history looks at sort of these histories, these particularly uh, problematic histories. So. I want to talk about a very specific dynamic of uh, people who play video games, which is that um, I, I personally feel that for a lot of gamers, video games are as close as they get to meditation in their daily routine, right? It is when you read what gamers say about playing games, a lot of it, uh, one of the biggest things you'll always see is that it is downtime. It is their way to recuperate after a long day. And the thing is, I, I don't meditate much, but I don't think I'd be able to meditate at all if you forced me to play a political radio station while I tried to meditate, right? And I, I think that most people make games with this in mind, whether, whether or not they have put it into the same words, you make games with the idea in mind that a lot of your players are just looking to, to use this as something akin to meditation. So when it comes to a game like Civilization, their goal is not actually to be apolitical because that is of course impossible for a game like Civilization, impossible for every game really. Instead, the goal is not to challenge players on a political axis. So a game like Civilization has is by the, the um, ecosystem in which it is built, it will naturally tend to reinforce whatever people know with, like, have have absorbed naturally, right? So, I think that it, it's like part of the problem is this specific aspect of people playing games, which, if we were more used to games challenging us on political axes, on personal axes, like challenging us in the way that. Uh, books, movies, and music, tradi other traditional media does, then we would be more open to seeing it from games, right? But a lot, I feel that a lot of people play games for a very specific purpose. But also, um, if games have to, have to reinforce what people think they know about history, it is natural that they will uh, reinforce colonial thought. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, uh, the sort of the dichotomy that always exists in games, you know, between sort of games as a system for play and games as a system of representation, uh, you know, is, can often create this kind of conflict, particularly when you're trying to 
sort of create a flow state in the player, for example, which might mean them not thinking critically about the representation. Um, so I think you're right. And I think, you know, the sort of growth of the indie sector has shown that there is an appetite increasingly for people to engage sort of politically and, uh, and, and meaningfully uh, with games as representations. But I think it's a really good point to highlight, yeah, definitely. Um, Ashley, uh, how much of this is a problem with games? How much of this is a wider problem? Um, I think it's it's kind of both. Uh, I think, you know, you see games coming out of the military industrial complex, at least in the United States, you know, out of a military lab in, from Stanford. And the first game really kind of notable, um, one of the first notable video games, Space War. It's about war in space. It's inherently about colonization, you know? Um, and it, that, that speaks to a broader um, fascination with these types of narratives. I mean, you know, look at the popularity of, of Westerns across the globe, not just in the United States. Um, um, the fascination with war films, things like that. Um, and you see the same thing happening in, in video games. I mean, you look at something like success of the Call of Duty games, how successful that franchise is. Um, it, 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 it replicates a lot of the things you're seeing in other types of media, um, in, in novels and in film. Um, and, and it also has become a games problem in that um, the games industry is incredibly risk averse, incredibly risk averse because of the capital that goes into um, these types of developments, these you know multi-million dollar projects and the fact that games financially outstrip the film industry now by billions of dollars every year. Um, so if they, if you have a, a system that works like Call of Duty, I'm not like hating on Call of Duty, I'm just using it as an example that like these are kind of cookie cutter games. They're kind of reskinning the same game every every time they make a new one. And it's because it works, because people like it. It is a narrative that they like. It is a style of play that they like. Um, and why risk doing something different and potentially, you know, taking a huge financial loss? Um, and that's kind of that's kind of a games problem is that, you know, um, there's Anna Anthropy is a game designer and a game studies scholar. And she kind of makes this argument that like, we just, we design games in the same ways over and over again. Like there's a, so much potential for different types of designs. We're just not doing it. It's not that we can't, we're just not because we like these things. And like I said, the games, games, uh, game developers are like, well, I don't know, I don't wanna gamble, you know? Um, so I think it's a games problem and a broader kind of social issue as well. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a uh, that's really good answer. Um, you know, as soon as you talk about the military industrial complex, immediately think of something like America's Army, you know, the, the recruitment game uh, that the army used. And um, I think one of the most interesting things about that is that no player ever plays as the insurgent, or at least they don't realize that they are. Every, the, the opposite team see each other as different skins, basically. So you always think you're playing as America's Army and that very much sort of uh, ties into that kind of notion. And uh you know, I think you're right. I think it extends further as well. We we see it throughout popular culture, right? Where I don't think it's an accident that the sort of superhero uh, movies have become such a huge thing at a time when the world is more politically complex than ever. And suddenly we see people return to uh, these very simplistic sort of uh, narratives of good versus evil, a very, you know, morally sort of basic. Um, and I know other scholars have sort of argued that was why you know in the 70s star wars was such a success because vietnam was complicated and morality was ambiguous and so you know this story of good versus evil and you know jedis and stuff was you know a very nice remedy for that so i absolutely see you know the, the sort of uh, links there that you're kind of talking about between sort of cinema and games and stuff um okay so maybe we could talk a little bit about um, in your uh, blog post, Ashley, uh, you talked about a kind of uh, counterplay, um, these sort of uh, the whole scale um, kind of groups and communities, which is fantastic. I love that. Um, and so counterplay is sort of uh, for the audience that uh, don't know as ways where players sort of engage with games in ways that run counter to the implied or expected types of activity. Um, and we tend to talk about um, games and uh, the represent representations of history a lot in terms of production often and in terms of design um, and the kind of meanings embedded into games. But what role do audiences play in challenging the colonialist assumptions in games uh, or indeed other forms of playful heritage? Um, you know, how important is the sort of the way that the audiences engage with games or film or exhibits? Um, 
what can we do to sort of highlight that role and encourage sort of um, more progressive forms of interaction, I suppose. Um, so maybe we could go to Ashley first for this. I think this is actually counterplay is one of the big ways to to get the games industry to change the things that they're making um, because it's showing them other things that players want by not playing the games that in the ways that is intended um, players are demonstrating that they are desiring something else and if you're not going to give it to me I'm going to make it in the space that you've given me um, and I think that's a really really powerful message and you, you've seen that um, throughout kind of the history of play with things like the speedrunning community like that's certainly not the way those games are intended to be played um, with um, things like the modding community being incredibly prevalent and powerful and, and, and some of those people actually being hired like Dota 2 coming out of the fact that like that was a mod um, and that person got hired by um, the company to make Dota you know that like a n whole new game came out of a mod um, and, I, and I think that's like a really a powerful position for players to be in is to kind of like play wrong, play differently, um, and demonstrate to developers that like there's other things that they can do and it will please a wide variety of people. Um, and, you know, I think it's kind of anti colonial and anti capitalist to play in these ways because, especially like what I was talking about in Red Dead Online, like that game is very much driven by the capitalism in the game world itself. And outside of the game through microtransactions and stuff. And the, the girls who, the women identified people who play that game in that way, the, the kind of horse girls um, are completely not, not only not interested in it, but also just like shirking it completely and not engaging with it. And it is, it is not the way that the developers <laughs> intended them to play. Um, and I think that's just fascinating and a, a really kind of powerful move um, to, and it also allows you like by playing playing wrong, you are testing the limits of the game and by testing the limits and finding out what you can and cannot do, you are really bringing into light what the game wants from you, what the game is telling you that it is about, what its mission is um, by trying to not do that. I think there's no better way to find out um, the underlying st structure of the game and also what is the actual dominant narrative by trying to not do it. Um, yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, and I think there really is this sort of transgressive kind of resistant quality to that kind of play. The kind of uh, play that sort of care or called like Paegic play, that sort of uh, spontaneous sort of organic like grows from communities rather than the structured um, sort of competitive play that the games industry tends to run on, um, and which has a natural resonance with capitalism because you know capitalism is about the ordering of things and the production of systems, whereas this sort of more paedic play, this this spontaneous play has, you know, literally no function other than, you know, social bonding and, and you know, that sense of community and, and fun, you know. Uh, so I think there is there is actually a natural tension there between this kind of play and and the sort of capitalist um, sort of bedding or foundation of, of the games industry or the forms of play that it has produced anyway. So I think that's a, a really nice reflection. Uh, and yeah, absolutely, the modern community um, there's a great uh, modding project actually for civilization uh, called the post-colonial modding project uh, which was started by two people originally uh, but lots of people sort of contributed to it now and there's there's all sorts of uh, mods um, some of them are just about sort of trying to represent uh, indigenous communities for example that have never been uh, in in the civilization series or um, or sort of kingdoms or factions that have been lost because of sort of the way that colonialism has formed sort of collective memory. Um, but some of them try and do things like represent slavery, which, you know, they do to varying degrees of success, let's say, you know, but it's the willpower in that community is generally, a, you know, uh, they do this as a public good, or at least they see this act as a public good. And I think that's something really interesting about modding and its sort of power um, that, there is this desire to get found by the games industry and maybe get a job for a lot of people. There is also this sense that, hang on, historical games are important and we think this history deserves a better representation and more time. And I, I really find that encouraging as a sort of community-led sort of response to uh, to game, games industry representations. Um, oh, sorry, I've lost my order now. Um, uh, Stella, uh, the 
Same question, what, what role do audiences play here in trying to readdress these, these kind of colonialist embedded histories? Ooh. I'm trying I'm trying to think from because when I think of audiences, I suppose I'm thinking of audiences to an exhibition or audiences to come in and, 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 vi and visit the That's library. Fine, really. And I suppose traditionally in cultural heritage, it, it's very kind of curators write the interpretation and it's very kind of that way. But but I mean I'm quite interested in in kind of new new ways of display and 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 kind of um I suppose even thinking of quite playful and interactive ways to to kind of um, share collections. Um, I mean, I mean, for me, I'm interested in creative reuse of collections. So for me and the department I'm in, by being able to digitise collections and make them available under Creative Commons licences or available as public domain, for me, that's the ultimate way of sharing cultural heritage collections, because then people can interpret them and examine them and work with them. Um, and, and often, like, if, if they're digitised at a kind of high resolution and you can zoom in, it, it, it's, it's, you can see details that the that's even hard to see, to see if you're there with the physical item in real life. Um, but but yeah, multiple interpretations. Curators aren't always right. Create, curators have their own biases. Institutions have their own biases. We're all very aware of this. I, I think kind of my generation of cultural heritage professionals are, are, are pretty kind of aware of many of these issues. Um, we're always kind of questioning how, how we do our work. We have our we've set up quite a few reading groups for staff, so staff reading groups in the British Library where we will kind of read articles and discuss things, and we're really trying to kind of do things kind of differently um, to, to kind of how they were before. Um, so yeah, co co creation, co curation. There's a, there's a lot of that we've been doing quite a lot of crowdsourcing projects on Zooniverse so I'm not talking about kind of so much kind of games projects but um, it, it's kind of how can we work with people um, and, and they can help us discover new things about our collections that, that um, we might not know about them. Um, it, it's, it's kind of quite exciting times. Thinking of Ashley's work, what I'm quite interested in, because this kind of subversive, subversive kind of um, doing things in games world that, that you that the creators aren't intending you to do unless there's evidence like the blog post you wrote or videos on YouTube or things like this I do kind of think in the in the future people might not realize that this kind of this kind of activities were happening um, and I do there is part of me I suppose there's a kind of thinking of preserving for the future say if say if YouTube was to go down and we were to lose all the footage on YouTube how would the people of the future know that this type of activity was happening so I'm, I'm just thinking in, in like web archiving communities so we have the UK web archive but we don't archive YouTube we have a tendency not to um crawl multimedia so 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 in some in some cases a lot of web archiving activity is very kind of image and text based so I do worry about an awful lot of kind of video footage of games that's on the web that that's kind of maybe not being kind of crawled and web archived for the future and and will will this kind of part of gaming culture be lost um yeah yeah absolutely yeah I, I, you know it's it's hard enough to preserve the history of games, you know, but the history of games culture itself, you know, is even more ephemeral in some ways. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there is so much interesting activity that goes on with historical games that will basically be lost unless we document it in some way. Um, you know, particularly the, these kind of counterplay practices, absolutely. You know, the, the, the way people play strategy games, for example, and have come up with relatively transgressive within the confines of those systems ways to play, you know, that, that is something that could be lost uh, in its richness, at least, unless we sort of document it. Um, so uh, the same uh, question for Nikhil, then what uh, role do players have in sort of addressing these kind of, um, these kind of embedded colonial sort of uh, assumptions? So uh, first of all, I love the article, Ashley. I think that, um, subversive play is incredibly important. I think every person who plays video games needs to spend some time just playing subversively, just so that they can start to appreciate what video games are as a medium. And I think it's actually a trickier proposition than um, it might originally appear. 
So a couple of days ago, I, uh, I listened to a Zoom panel, much like this one, that pushed, um, it had um, Akar Patel, who wrote a book called The Price of Modi's India, about, um, about the cost of the Modi years, right? The various, uh, various economic and uh, liberty costs that have come with the BJP government. And it was opposed by two Hindutva writers. And, you know, I, I'm, I wasn't, I was just an audience member for this, right? So I couldn't talk or anything, but I could swear at the screen when the Hindutva people were on. And whenever I listen to right-wing conversations, I tend, to I tend to swear at the screen a lot because this is, uh, this is the autonomy that that medium affords me. With video games, however, because they have so much autonomy baked in, the explicit autonomy of video games, of I can do this instead of that, is so bright, it kind of, the glare kind of obscures all of the other autonomy you have in it. So you tend not to question the systems themselves. And this is exacerbated because questioning the systems will make you worse at the game. If you're trying to get good at golf and you're thinking in your head, this would be so much easier if I could just pick up the ball, you are not going to get better at golf, right? So I think that people who play games need to become literate enough with how to play games that they can understand the systems inside it and they can think critically about whether other systems would be better. Right? And I mean, that's, that's a lot of why I'm building civilization so that you can see it in conversation with civilization. Right? But this subversive play is a critical part of becoming a literate video gamer. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really good point. I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, discourse generally about whether games should be part of curriculum in formal education, for example. But I think the thing we overlook is that teaching people how to critically respond to games, to how to unpack them and, and sort of understand them different, because of course they work differently than other media forms, is something that is more important in a sense. Um, and, you know, I don't hold that much hope because that is not really part of the curriculum for film or you know, in, in most places. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really good point. And, and we're so trained by the games industry, right? You know, you know, as Ashley said, once you've played your fifth Call of Duty, you don't expect anything more from Call of Duty than what Call of Duty is. So you, you don't look around for anything else, you know, even if it were possible. Um, so I, I think it's really useful to think in those terms as well. mute myself by accident. Uh, one or two more questions um, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Um, so if uh, anyone in the audience wants to put their questions in the chat, um, then um, someone will select them. Um, okay, let me just choose a good one. Um, okay, um, so in the blog post for the HDN, uh, Maurice Suckling described a number of board games uh, in his blog for our theme that offered kind of thematic or mechanical solutions to exploring issues of colonialism in more nuanced or uh, sensitive ways. Um, are there any games, mechanics, or interactive or playful exhibition techniques, you know, anything sort of that fall, we would put under the, the uh, heading of interactive interactivity or, or play uh, that any of you would like to highlight that you think offers something um, progressive to representing issues such as colonialism and sort of post-colonialist discourses in more progressive ways. So this is sort of the, the round of you get to do a, a shout out to something that uh, you think is, is useful in this regard. Uh, I've completely lost the order of the questions. Uh, so, oh, Stella. Can I give a shout out to Clockwork Watch? I don't know here, so it's not so much a game, I'd say maybe a transmedia story world, but if people want to kind of look at uh, Clockwork Watch, I'm interested, sorry for seizing on, on this, but kind of, I suppose it takes, takes a steamwork steampunk world but in a very different direction um and it is quite political um but it's exciting it, it, it's it's pretty exciting and they have kind of what i can only describe as like live action role play events and then turn the participation from the live action role play events into graphic novels um and they've been selling um pins ba basically um 
to kind of I, I suppose it's kind of to be pro steampunk anti-racist and they've been selling selling pins and the money's all been going to charity so if I could just give a shout out to them because it's kind of almost like um yeah I suppose you can have assumptions about kind of steampunk and like a Victorian um story world um but but like i say they they do it in a very very clever smart way um and i'm just so kind of excited by what they do like i say from these like live action events at festivals and and, and whatever but then turn them into graphic novels so i know it's not a video game example but um yeah that's that's who i want to give the shout out to and i'll put a link to it in in the chat oh that's great thank you yeah it's uh, uh maybe not a video game but certainly play and uh, certainly you know uh, a playful form of engagement to pass so very much in our remit. Uh, Ashley? Yeah uh, two um, indigenous designers who I want to give shout outs to um, Nathan Palace Lines he has a game called Hold My Hand uh, he has a couple his the way he uses mechanics is brilliant he has another game called Brawlygon which is a fighting game about fitting polygonal shapes together which is hilarious and fantastic. Um, and then he has a game called Hold My Hand, which is, it's just two little avatars who's, who have to hold hands to traverse these um, physics puzzles and like and different puzzles within the game. But the wonderful thing about it is it is about relationship building in that it is a two player game played on one controller. So it is literally like you are holding hands. You have to stand there together and hold this controller and talk to each other and form a relationship to to successfully create the game and the space of play and i think especially in the age of online games which can be not at all about relationship building or friendliness um that's a brilliant mechanic um and and we've also kind of lost the like local two-player game a little bit um, in favor of online games. And so I really love that mechanic and bringing that back. And then Elizabeth LaPensee's Thunderbird Strike, um, which is about you play as Thunderbird in Anishinaabe culture and you are saving um, sacred spaces from resource extraction. Um, and it's a really brilliant game. Hilariously got her accused of inciting environmental terrorism, which I think is a whole nother conversation. But um, the wonderful mechanics about that game is you can choose to either like use Thunderbird's lightning to destroy trucks and pipelines and things like that, or to reanimate um, animals and plant life that has been killed by resource extraction. And you can win either way or through a combination of of either. The game doesn't tell you which one to do. Not it doesn't prioritize. Um, one mode of play over the other. You can go in and be full force destruction, or you can go in and kind of um, help bring things back or a combination of both. Um, and I like that the game gives you the option um, and it, to, to do, to, do um, to play in different ways. Oh, they both sound like great examples. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Nikon? Um, I want to shout out Meghna Jayant. I hope you get better soon. I wish you were on this panel. Yeah, uh, play Sable. But I do also want to make a small point about that article. And as somebody who, uh, who's completely working in post-colonial games, right, I refuse to play No True Scotsman because it's very easy to do in this space. But I do want to say that what excites me the most in this space is not just anti-colonial statements, which are fairly easy to get to given uh, the history of video games, but actually post-colonial sta uh, statements. And as part of that, the, I think now that civilization is getting closer and closer to launch, a thing that I'm coming to terms with is that there are still statements in it that I'm just not very comfortable with that sort of come from staying in the Forex space. I wanted civilization to be recognizably a Forex game. And a thing I think about a lot is that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And you're always somewhat constrained by what you're doing. So what I'm going to do with Civilization is once it launches, I'm actually going to write, I'm going to write down myself all of the places where I failed at making a post-colonial statement with the game. Because I think that's a necessary part of being a post-colonial game designer is trying to build the foundation for future game developers. To, to go where you where you just were not able to go yourself. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, just as a sort of follow-on question to that, Nicole, uh, uh, just talking about the 
the difficulty of escaping entirely the, the sort of template um, of colonialism that the Fourier scheme kind of creates. Do you see uh, a future where something like civilization could shake off its sort of embedded colonial logics and, and sort of a big a mainstream sort of Forex game like that? Will it ever happen or is it it's too embedded within the very sort of foundation of the, of the uh, Forex strategy genre? Um, you know, I think, I think that it can. So my, my dream for civilization is that after civilization, all post, all Forex games have at least one um, win condition that's cooperative and not competitive, right? Civilization itself, it, it has a lineage that is in part board games where uh, board games of the time had to have one winner, you know? And can it fully shake, can the big market Forex game civilization ever fully shake off its colonial heritage? I think there's a long, long way it can go. I think it, I, I believe in those guys. I'm sure that sooner or later they'll get there. However, I don't think that they, I think that something like say great man theory is just so firmly baked in something like, something like the bird's eye view of history. It's just so firmly baked in. I don't see how they can do it. However, I do believe that in the future, it is completely plausible that we'll see a post-colonial Forex game become mainstream, even if it's not from the civilization lineage. And I think that game would look entirely different from what the civilization games look like. Because one of the, the, the most fundamental piece of looking like a civilization game is in the map. Right? It's, in a, it's in a focus on topology. And to go to, I, I think that if you were to truly make a, a forex, a post-colonial forex game, you would vastly de-emphasize land itself. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a, a lot of sense to me. That's sort of sort of wrote about a bit in my blog post. Sort of think about space as conceptual rather than a literal, physical, you know, conquerable space. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, I think we. Um, We'll maybe draw a line under my questions there um, and take some questions from the audience. Uh, I think, first of all, let me just, sorry, look, uh, we have a question from Javier, uh, who's going to ask his question himself on camera, I think. Uh, here we are. Great panel as ever, HGN team. So my question is about how can we communicate these post-colonial ideas to the public? Fortunately here, we care about questioning this, but as Nikhil and Ashley have mentioned, uh, sometimes players may be too used to games with established content in order to relax by the end of the day. So I have seen some opportunities, but I'd love taking this into consideration from players. How can, um, we still communicate some more informed ideas that question colonial misconceptions. An example of an opportunity is the story driven games. In that genre, there's always the expectation of drama. You need to have a conflict, otherwise you don't get a story rolling. And in our case, what we have discovered is that in that particular kind of game, you can package the rest of the game with what players expect so you get the relaxation, the flow mode that players are looking for at the end of the day. But the conflict can come uh, from something that is questioning a colonial mis misconception. So that can happen with a character who may not be the usual one that you see repeated in games or a narrative arc that is going against uh, a colonial misconception. This is just one example that has worked so far, but I wonder, have you also noticed uh, some mechanics or some genres that more easily question colonial misconceptions, considering that the, the massive public maybe are just looking to relax at the end of the day. But it is still possible, I believe, to question colonial misconceptions. Um, who would like to engage with that? Um, any, anybody? It's a hard one, maybe. I mean, yeah, I think like I think there's a potential to use mechanics to do this to the to do to do this type of thing. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with designing. Uh, sorry, the phone is ringing. Uh, designing um, 
a game that doesn't allow for like just inherent consumption of things. Um, we could, you know, they kind of hinted at it in Assassin's Creed 3 with the hunting mechanic that like if you don't, they just didn't go all the way, that if you don't skin five animals in a row, like you'll desynchronize because that would be like a waste and like Connor as a Mohawk person wouldn't have done that. Then they went and like, as long as you skin all the animals, you can kill as many as you want and selling pelts is the quickest way to make money in that game. So they really missed the mark, but like it was so close, you know what I mean? Like you could do something like yeah. that with engaging cultural perspectives or or things like that. Um, the The morality meter in the Red Dead Redemption games kind of doesn't matter. Um, just kind of changes like the story a little bit of like how you're perceived by other characters and like the ending a little bit. But you could do so much more with something like that. Like that if you have, if you do bad things, like it's going to be harder for you to exist in the world. It's going to be harder for you to play. Like bad things are going to happen. You're going to hurt other characters that you care about. Like, you know, there's a way to um, to do that type of thing mechanically that I think would be fascinating. And, and I think it's a little bit of like, developers are afraid to to do those kinds of things a little bit because they're like you said they're breaking out of the established mold of what players expect in their game but like maybe it's just me i'm like i don't think there's anything wrong with that that sounds exciting to me but mm. thanks a lot ashley do you need funding sometimes i'm, I'm just thinking if funding was made available I, I don't know whether it'd be government funding or charitable funding or foundation funding there'd be a bit more freedom for people to be braver and bolder and more experimental because like I say what I've been most excited of when I've been to like degree shows at universities and students are allowed a lot of creative freedom or or people who not make, needed, needed to make a profitable game and I do sometimes wonder is I, I don't know could there be new sources of funding and then you get different types of games um yeah don't know where from. I'm quite interested in kind of serious games and interactive documentaries and um, but but yeah, I suppose it's just kind of new types of funding streams, whether there's any angel investors or 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 charitable trusts or whoever that will kind of kind of fund this work. Um, I've mentioned Welcome Trust before, but they've they've funded the development of, of games and I think I think you might get some more experimental trying to do something different if that happens. Thank you, everyone. Okay, um, let's see. I don't know if we have another uh, question from the audience at the moment. Um, oh, hang on. Okay, so what we have one here uh, from Jackson Armstrong, who says, um, thinking about Stella's words on empathy and narratives, how can or should game writers give voices to the colonized peoples, both where recorded sources exist and especially where they don't? Uh, in other words, can hidden, suppressed and erased voices be imagined responsibly by game writers? Um, so maybe uh, Ashley, would, uh, would you want to say something on that? Yeah, I mean, this is something that I preach over and over again is like, hiring people who come from those communities, if you have access to that, to work on your game. I'm going to put Games Lab on blast, the people who made This Land is My Land, for not doing that. I myself and so many other Indigenous designers I know reached out to them in Alpha and said, you know, you could get people to consult on this, people would work with you. Not only did they not do that, they now silence Indigenous voices who are responding to their game and saying this is problematic by like deleting forum posts and things like that and blocking people on twitter and whatever you know indigenous communities would be i'm just speaking for indigenous communities in in, uh, in this regard like are happy to consult on things like we want the representation to be good because it's important for how we exist in a broader cultural narrative um it's important for how our young people see themselves respect reflected in these spaces um should you pay us for our labor? Yeah. Um, but, you know, I don't think you would see a lot of people asking for astronomical amounts. There would be people who would be, myself included, who are like very happy to consult on these types of things. And it's just that um, a lot of games companies don't want to be bothered. They kind of want to do what they want to do. And it's also a problem of player bases not 
not necessarily knowing when they're seeing something problematic or offensive or historically inaccurate. You know what I mean? There's a there's a educational gap there as well. Um, so we need to educate our players of like ask for better things, want better things from from these companies, and voice your opinions when you hear when you see something that you don't like. Talk about it. You know that we we talk about we've talked about how players now have a bigger voice than ever, and I think that's really important to say. Um, you know, ah, we didn't like that. We want something different. We want something better. Um, we want to know the people you hired to consult on this. Like, what was their experience working on the game? Those types of things. Um, yeah, that makes I, just, I just wanted to add, um, the other thing is just go to spaces where uh, non-traditional communities are making games. You know, just stop asking the game industry to get better because, I mean, they are the game industry. Just People are making games, just go play them. And a shout out uh, Studio Olio Minkes. They make fantastic anti-colonial games. They're based in Pune in India. You can just, you don't have to read uh, writers with no background trying to make, trying to be a character. You can just read people with the background who do it. Um, yeah, oh, sorry. Well, uh, I'm just trying to, uh, go through the chat at the same time <laughs> not good at multitasking um yeah absolutely yeah thank you for that um i just wondered we had one question here um i think it might be a question more for ashley um uh but, but, but it's someone was asking sorry i've lost who it was apologies for that uh i was just wondering about the post-colonial discourses uh essential to game studies itself as a discipline uh heisinger and roger kilwa uh grounding their concepts of the magic circle and modes of play in deeply problematic discourses on race and civilization um i was wondering how much historical game studies as a discipline might be able to tackle these issues um so is there a root sort of uh problem with where our own discourses emerge from um i don't know it, that's a difficult question i think um yeah i think heisinger uses a very sort of reductionist notion of civilization in some ways mm -hmm. um he has the kind of a bit like the civilization game where it's sort of ultimately civilization ends up in the sort of uh the united nations essentially you know in, in the regulation of warfare and things like that um but then i do you think he also pays quite a lot of attention to a variety of cultures and, and sort of playful practices? Um, yeah, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that, Ashley. Yeah, I mean, I do think there is some, uh, can we look at like the big hitters of like media studies and game studies and like Huizinga and like McLuhan and things like that and, and the mediums that they prioritize and how those are inherently tied to culture and race and um, class and things like that. Like, you know, for the longest time, the narrative was that um, indigenous people were not civilized because we, because some of some of us did not have written languages. And then you see McLuhan, McLuhan referring to text as a cold medium, not a hot medium. Like that, it um, his is dying out a little bit, and it needs to be rejuvenated, and it doesn't bring the same things that like film or photography or whatever do. So, you know, um, there's this gap between like. Well, okay, I thought, I thought written language was like the be all end all of everything, but now it's, you know, it's conveniently now a, a cold medium. Um, um, so I, I do think it's kind of, and when you talk about like games themselves coming out of this complicated history of like the military industrial complex, it's going to be um, inherently bound up in, um, in the study of games as well. Um, and the fact that when we talk about play, what do we mean by that? And and what types of play are we talking about? And what types, what do we qualify as a game or something worth study? Um, and um, whose voices get to be a part of that conversation? Um, I think that that now is, is the big issue of like, a lot of it is founded in these very Western logics. And a lot of academia in general is founded in like very Western logic. So for example, like I have to have read Huizinga and McLuhan and Heidegger and whatever. But if you ask like a lit studies scholar, if they've read like Deloria and Leduc and things like that, you know what I mean? There's, it's not a two way street. Um, so broadening these conversations um, and bringing different voices, I think into the study of games uh, is really, really, really valuable. <laughs> 
Um, Stella, I, I guess this kind of relates to uh, sort of archival work as well, where you have this sort of huge body of evidence from um, a, a very sort of uh, the colonial infrastructure, if you like. Uh, and yet, as you mentioned before, it's, it's really difficult to sort of find um, a balance in that kind of evidence. How, how do you address this as a, as a kind of institution, like moving forward? Is it, this is the evidence we have and we, we've just got to work with it in ways we can or? It's really difficult. What I will mention is what we've digitized, certainly in organizations with fast collections. And so British Library, we give an estimate of our collections as 180 million objects, items, whatever. I know what we've digitized is a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage. And so what I will say, going back to this funding question, trying to get funding to digitize is, is, is complicated. And often what is digitized it is what can be monetized. So there's quite a lot of commercial partnerships, um, especially with organizations who can make services and products safe for family history, um, communities, so, so find my past. Um, it's a big digitizer. Google, Google Books. Um, it, it, it's it, it's it's often. I hate for it to keep going back to the money, but it it, it, it it's like who, often it's it's who is paying for the work. So even in terms of kind of the digitization of cultural heritage collections, often what is digitized and made available often comes down to who funds that digitization work um, and and the kind of the drivers behind that um, and certainly there are things in collections when you've got collections at that sort of scale that there, there's all sorts of material that might not have been looked at for decades or years we've got books where the pages are still the pages have never even been cut open after being published and it's actually quite exciting if someone in, in a reading room at the British Library calls up books that have never been read by anyone and a conservator has to come come down with special equipment and cut the pages open and, and that Literally, there, there is undiscovered material in collections, um, but but like I say, in, in terms of kind of what's available um, for remote researchers and creatives to use is, is, is what is digitised and who's paid for that. Um, yeah, we're certainly interested in, in kind of looking at looking at all trying to trying to pull out the interesting stories and, and and different stories and 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 kind of analyze that but but it really it is kind of getting research funding um British Library and a lot of the big organizations we are research organizations we can kind of apply for research grants um and then it's often often you can do the more interesting exciting work is if you can get some external funding to do to do that and bring researchers in um and yeah, and focusing on what we're collecting at the moment. Um, so I noticed in the chat someone earlier on mentioned community radio. We've been setting up a, um, a radio archive at the British Library and we are, have been archiving community radio. Um, it, it, it's kind of how, how can we do better with collecting current material, but certainly with historical collections, often it is what what's in there already. But but when you've got such such huge, it's almost impossible to manage it imagine actually when you think 180 million items how do you even visualize in your head what do 180 million items look like I will never see even a tiny percentage of that even if I even if I work for the British Library for a long time so yeah it's it's um we just have to kind of keep trying to get grants get researchers in do interesting work and, and kind of discover and, and use material in interesting ways yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually, when you sort of talk about the scale of the, the, the stuff you have there. It's, it's, it's not a question of imbalancing the evidence, right? It's a question of how you select it and what kind of pressures are exerted on that process. And, you know, research funding is, of course, at the core of, you know, uh, so much. It's the same in historical game studies where it can often be really difficult to get funding for projects that uh, are game related because, you know, funding bodies tend to be fairly conservative or, you know, take a while to adapt to actually this is a serious topic of study now. So I, I guess we all fight the same uh, battles in our different respective areas. Um, Nikhil, I wondered if you wanted to uh, add to the, that sort of question, is, is there a kind of embedded uh, problematic kind of assumptions in sort of the theory of games design as well, you know, the, the kind of the, the oh. body of literature there? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was going to say I've never, I've never actually read Yuzinga. So, but in game studies itself, it's it's endemic. My, I mean, I, I feel like that's a whole 
panel discussion to itself, you know? It's just there's, uh, there, there are a number of problems the just around who who writes the books, um, what their backgrounds are, and just who they look at when they make the books. When you think of all of the studies that people do that are supposed to be foundational to how people play games, who are those studies run on, you know? It's, but I feel like that's way out of the scope of this uh, panel discussion. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very true, they're very relevant. You know, I mean, we've seen the same in a number of academic uh, subjects where, you know, they've extrapolated, you know, very particular social group experiences to be the human experience. So absolutely, it, it makes total sense. Uh, okay, I think we have time for one more question, uh, which I've lost, of course, um, which is from our very own Nick Weber, uh, HGN's very own Nick Weber. Uh, he says, uh, in a recent exploration of the creative industries called Culture is Bad for You, uh, Orion, Brooke, Dave O'Brien and Mark Taylor ask if it's possible to fix inequality in the creative industries without fixing inequality in society. Uh, as in, can culture make a difference or can we only fix culture by fixing the world? Um, is the same question relevant here? Can we have lasting impact on the issues of colonialism through culture, through games? Or are the background conditions too limiting and we will always lose ground? Um, so that seems like a good question for us to finish on. Uh, does anybody want to uh, jump in on that question? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, I've got a I've got a slightly complicated answer to this. So um, what I want to start with is there's a trend that I often see of people saying, "Oh, you know, we'll just fix racism, for instance, if we just get people to write books at the right age." And a thing I want to bring up um, because of my work with Indian colonialism is that the, the British people who functioned as colonists were highly and classically educated. Rudyard Kipling was, it was supposed to be the, the peak of culture at the time. And he wrote some really racist stuff. And it wasn't just racist by the, it wasn't just that, that's how everybody was at the time. No, he was very racist for his time, right? But having, so, you know, uh, there's, there's a recent uh, thing that went around. I, I mean, I, I, I haven't actually looked into it, but it talked about the proportion of manual scavengers in Delhi by caste, right? And out of, I think, 43,000, 42 and a half thousand manual scavengers were Dalits. You know, and I am here right now because of Brahminical privilege. You know, I like my education, the resources afforded to me, the the my my career is built on Brahminical privilege, and you cannot, you you can't escape those material conditions. But what I what I want to also say is that even given material, even given. Um, material backing, there are cultural issues holding back many minorities. We, there, if I walk down in, um, if I walk down streets in Bangalore, I'll see places which say that they're for rent, but only to vegetarians, right? Which is systematically excluding many communities in India. You know, if, if when recently we saw that case in Intel, where uh, the programmers would check, pe would check people for cast threads to see if they would fit in the in-group. So I, I think that you can't escape the fact that material conditions enable people, but you also need to accept that in addition to material uh, conditions holding people back, there are cultural issues also holding people back. It's not an either or, we need to do both. Does anybody else want to uh, add anything to that? Yeah, I, I agree completely. And I think that sometimes this is the problem when, like, do I think for indigenous folks, as an example, like, do I think more indigenous people need to make video games? Yeah, absolutely. Instead of just, you know, asking the big, the big um, developers to make better games. But the problem with that is that, like, that's a really hard thing to ask when some reservations don't have running water, you know, or electricity, let alone internet or access to computers or things like that. You know, I have the good fortune of like 
I got to make games because I was a grad student and I didn't have to worry about the financial success of the game that I made. You know what I mean? Um, I had access. Um, and so access is, is uh, a huge problem in terms of allowing diverse groups of people to make games. If you don't have access, then the best that you can do is ask for other people to do better on your behalf. Obviously, that's not the answer that we want, but it's going to have to, it matters for now until we can solve problems of access. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, it's a it's an interesting tension. Uh, Esther and I are currently writing a little bit about this because we're doing a paper on uh, Mafia 3. And we constantly hear this uh, notion that we need, obviously it's moral and correct for everyone to be represented in uh, our media, you know, and, and uh, there should be diversity within media, but it's sort of always positioned as, positioned as the solution. And it's kind of a very patronizing uh, thing to oppress groups, I think, to say, oh, well, all you need to do is see yourself and then you'll go and be whatever, you know, job it is, completely forgetting the structural level. So it's like a kind of very neoliberal discourse in, in a sense about sort of oppression and prejudice. Um, that sort of um, leaves behind the kind of structural issues, of course, as you as you mentioned, that allow people to actually, you know, uh, uh, occupy these roles in society. Uh, Stella, did you want to add anything on that um, that topic? No, but but <clears throat> just to completely agree, and yeah, I'm I'm just thinking I won't name a com a company. Remember talking to a company about a potential donation of VR headsets to public libraries. Um, but the public libraries wouldn't have had the hardware to have run the VR headset, so this didn't happen. Um, so you, sometimes you can have some quite well-meaning companies thinking, yes, we'll do something to make something more accessible um, to people who might not have this equipment at home. Um, but, but, but like you said, there's just so many issues of availability of resources. Um, yeah, it, it's, I don't even know where to begin. Um, yeah. I think that's fair. We've 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 hit on quite a uh, tough, long-standing question there of you know the the relation between material and cultural conditions, which uh, you know a hundred years on we're, we've still not entirely solved. So, <laughs> um, so I think that's all we've got time for, sadly. Uh, so let me just say uh, thank you so much to our speakers. Uh, who have all provided us with fantastic uh, responses and lots to think about. Um, and to Nikhil uh, for stepping in at the last moment as well. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. And let me say thank you to our audience as well for uh, joining us. As always, uh, it's all of you that uh, make the work we do at the HGN, one, worth it and, and two, viable. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, as I mentioned, our next um, theme is education. So do go and check out the website and uh, look at the corporate papers there and see if there's anything uh, you'd like to submit for that. And uh, yeah, other than that, just uh, a big thank you to our, our speakers, obviously, and uh, to our audience. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you all next time.